Well, hello, everyone. Uh, we will start the talk today. It's my great pleasure to introduce the speaker today, Luna Maurer. Um, Luna is one of the co-founders of Studio Moniker. Uh, probably most of you know about Studio Moniker, but for the ones that don't know, Studio Moniker is a studio based in Amsterdam. They work between design, technology, and research. And I'm especially happy because um, Luna has been one of the, design, the designers I admire the most. Um, also because she has been leading kind of the interdisciplinary design right here in Europe. And when we think about interdisciplinary design, we tend to think about something that is very broad. I, I like to think of it as something that is not enclosed into the walls of disciplines. Uh, and we see a lot of universities, Elizabeth between them, but much others, saying you are a graphic designer, you are an editorial designer, you are a product designer, right? And, and Luna and Monica have kind of crossed these boundaries, these walls, to fight against these kind of limitations, these, these uh, frontiers, these borders. Um, understanding that design is more like a way of thinking rather than a box of tools. I, uh, Luna, with, with a bunch of other amazing people, um, has also created the Conditional Design Manifesto. I recommend it, it's a quick read. Also, she will be speaking about it today. Um, and one of the things I like about the manifesto is how it tried to avoid the idea of being defined by the media that you use, by the different tools that you use. And, and this is particularly interesting uh, for students and young designers, as I have seen a lot of crises a lot of identity design crisis uh, when trying to define yourself, mm -hmm. saying, getting out of the university and saying, am I a graphic designer? Am I an editorial designer or a product designer? What am I, right? And uh, my advice for those, and you will see with the, this talk, is that chill, relax. Like, <laughs> this is not that important. Uh, and you will see that crossing borders and not limiting yourself to the tools that you use as a, as a designer is something that is very important. Uh, it's more relevant to understand which are the values that you follow, which are the ideas that guide your work, right? And Luna within the Studio Moniker, they have explored this weird, fun, and, and, and really eclectic uh, relationship that we have between humans and technology. Um, and they have explored through like different, very different disciplines and, and medias, as you will see in the conference today. And also, as most of the studios that uh, we really admire, um, they have like this balance between uh, commission work from clients and self-commission work, like work projects that they do to explore themselves like different spaces of interest. Uh, so we are in for a real treat today. Uh, I want you to give a big and warm welcome to the one and only ah. Luna Maurer. <laughs> Well, that was such a wonderful uh, introduction. Thank you so much. I really feel like a pop star. <laughs> and thank you so much for inviting me over to Barcelona. I flew here today with a plane, and I'm really glad, although I go back tomorrow, that I come here physically, because we asked a lot of times to give presentations, and now because it's so easy to do that, and it became a new standard to do that uh, via Zoom or via digital media. And it is so different to be here that you see me, my whole body, that I'm nervous, and the whole energy, how everything works. So I think that is very great that this is happening. Uh, yeah, you introduced already my name, Luna Maurer, but I want to uh, repeat. Uh, so my practice, I have together with Ruhl Wouters, and we're like two directors. I met a lot of directors already. <laughs> And, but we have a lot of uh, super nice people that we work with. So you see here in the back um, some of the people, the team that I'm working with, we are fluctuating between like more or less people. Next month we have two people more and then less depending on the projects we're working on. Yeah, we are based in Amsterdam, you know that. And uh, but I actually I'm German, but I live a since a long time in the Netherlands. And um, let me... Uh, this is the right direction, yes. So, um, uh, especially for today, I made this talk, and I thought, um, 
I do, I call it different than usually I would do it. And I called it designing friction because that was also more interesting to me to think uh, and bring our work in a different context. And this is the context that I would like you to look at it as well. And um, well, we are known as you were introduced already very much also for doing these uh, web projects, experimental participatory uh, projects online on the web where the crowd basically joins in in order to create something together. So the product is created together with a big crowd. So, um, but as technology has changed dramatically uh, during the past years, that has also quite a lot of effect um, on our practice and how we deal with technology and what kind of works we do. And um, especially because with our work, we like to really reflect upon technology and how that influences our daily lives and how we deal with it every day. And then our work started to become more critical depending on how, how technology evol evolved. And at one point we also felt like, yeah, it's not so fun to make always these critical works. And we're looking also for new uh, terrains or uh, in fields of interest. Um, but designing friction is maybe something I was thinking that is the essence, what connects the work that we've done in the past and something that we are also interested in right now and uh, we believe very much in what we want to do in the future. So um, I'm going to uh, make a, be a little uh, now almost historical discourse. <laughs> I start 24 years ago. So basically um, 24 years ago, I already thought uh, I wanted to rethink um, the digital tools that we were presented with. Uh, and I thought, can't we introduce something more physical or the physical logic that we know uh, into the digital realm? And what I did, uh, I was studying at the Rietfeld Academy, that is the, oh, I have to click twice. No, wait a minute. Yeah, no, it's I was uh, studying at the Rietfeld Academy, that's the art academy in Amsterdam. I was studying graphic design and this was my final exam work. So um, I wanted to, I thought I'm presenting an alternative idea to the desktop metaphor. And I thought, uh, can't we make an environment that is liquid and soft and where folders behave like bubbles that are pulsating um, and that you can fuse together and pull out and the menu bar like a like a chewing gum that you can pull down so basically uh, i wanted to create this sen sensitive or yeah physical sensual <laughs> i don't know all the words uh environment and uh, that's uh, what I did, the teachers didn't really know what to do with this. They thought like, what is this? And, uh, but actually a year later, um, Apple brought out Mac OS 10 with the Aqua interface with this, uh, like shiny little glances on the side. So I was a bit proud, <laughs> but at the Sundberg Institute, that is the master, the second phase of the Rietfeld, they saw it and they thought, hey, this is interesting, please come to our school and we want you to study there. That was, uh, yeah, in 2001. And this is where I met Ruhl Wouters, that is also my current business partner. And together we were investigating this relationship between humans and machines. And we also brought the idea even further of uh, um, creating this physical world in the digital world and we thought can't we uh, become little living creatures in the desktop a completely crazy plan and we had the occasion or the offer to do work uh, during a design conference that was at uh, yeah, 2002 or something like that in Amsterdam so you had the speakers 
in the main hall in the in the concert building and then we rented out another floor above the speakers and we made a blue screen in there hang a camera and filmed ourselves from the ceiling and superimposed ourselves over the speaker's presentation so we were crawling over the presentation being watching tv watching the hard disk pulling fake down fake menu bars it is completely crazy, as if you imagine there are now two living creatures rolling over the presentation. So it is so, I mean, you must think this is more than 20 years ago. Things were different then, and it was still possible. And people weren't afraid. So this was also a little bit maybe the climate, climate in which I uh, grew up uh, design-wise. Yeah, so uh, basically then, uh, what was happening with digital technology was super interesting to us and we made works reflecting on this new phenomena. Uh, the web um, uh, started to emerge. We did experimental websites, films, performances. And um, yeah, we felt that the, the world when, when digital technology became so present was in, in, in flux and got really complex and as being trained graphic designers, we thought our work has to coincide with these developments. We don't want to make these static posters, but we want to make things that change and grow and are as dynamic as uh, the world around us was. So uh, that led also to the Conditional Design Manifesto that I've heard already this evening people know about, it's super nice. Um, the condition design was manifest. So, so basically, um, I had sparring partners that was Jonathan Paki and Edo Paulos. He was a sound artist or is a sound artist and Rul Wouters and myself. We met every Tuesday evening in my kitchen and we um, started uh, to think, rethink our practice. What does it mean we are not graphic designers or whatsoever you want to describe ourselves, what are we then? And then uh, we came up with the term conditional design. So uh, this is the manifesto. Um, I will briefly explain what is written in there. So um, the manifesto is about the fact that we thought we should design environments or frameworks in which a process can take place or that is triggering a process. But in order for such an environment to make, you need to design uh, constraints or um, limitations or rules or instructions, something that holds this environment and that also uh, defines the process that you uh, want to observe. And another par important part of this was the input. How, what is the input of such an environment or such a system that you want to use? And we were very um, uh, conscious about that we're interested in the uh, human characteristics. So uh, human interaction or maybe even nature, but the dirty world not something that comes from within the computer, not like, uh, um, you know, random numbers in order to generate always changing beautiful visuals, because at that time also generative art became very big, or generative design. But we were really studying what humans would do in such an environment that we would design. So, um, after um, <laughs> pretty young there still, well, never mind. Um, uh, after uh, writing and thinking about all these things, we thought, uh, let's keep on meeting. This is great. Uh, we continue to meet on Tuesday evenings and we would practice what we preach and we started to make all little experiments, sometimes program something small and then uh, play with it. But after a while we realized pen and paper is the best because uh, you have a sheet and you have a pen and directly you have uh, an output, right? There is, it is immediate. And so what we did was uh, a lot of rule-based drawings. 
and that was quite interesting because so it worked like that we always had this sheet and we had even the same color of pen the four of us and we would sit around the table and every week somebody else had to come up with a set of rules and you must see these rules you can see it almost as an algorithm and we designed it in such a way that there was a little bit space for you as a person to decide so basically, it was is different than a machine would execute this algorithm. So we uh, thought of those rules in such a way that you're very confined and very limited, but at the same time, you can decide how long your line would be and that would influence it. Or there were all kinds of ideas in which way you can take this little bit of space. And also this little bit of space leads to lots of engagement. Hey, this is my little freedom in which I can say or... And we had also a lot of fun, a lot of fights, hey, you made a mistake and all these kind of things. And in the end, there was actually no real end. It was um, uh, either the paper was full and we stopped or somebody had to go home. Or, uh, but in the end, well, we ended up with some kind of drawing. You could think also it's a beautiful drawing, but we said, yeah, it's not about the drawing, it's about the process and it's also interesting to see uh, ideally the process in the drawing so you would see hey there was you made a mistake or there something happened if you were part of it um, and um, also when making participatory works uh, we figured uh, its rewards are quite important and this is also it was a nice reward you could say and after doing that for quite a long time. Uh, that was in 2013, where we uh, published a book called the Conditional, Conditional Design Workbook, in which we published 10 of those workshops that we did, a selection. And um, yeah, it was really quickly sold out because it was so great now. <laughs> no, but also the, the mindset, it was really at that time also hitting a certain mindset, the idea of um, co you need to collaborate in order to get somewhere. And uh, yeah, so uh, an example is draw a perfect circle. So this was about the fact, the imperfection of the human hand and uh, or making knots that um, that rule said was about that you really need to think of a strategy. You needed each other in order to get further or draw, drawing blindfolded, so we altered our body in order to make something, or um, a uh, work where this one we had to draw one long line during one and a half hours without lifting your pen from the paper and uh, not cross any other line. So we basically, and talk about love. <laughs> So basically, uh, yeah, we brought us into very uncomfortable situations as well. And these limitations were also the fun part, or there, what I said earlier, this engagement is happening. And this, yeah, this uncomfortable situation, you could think also, as what I mentioned earlier, this friction that we were looking for in order to create something that, is, uh, that has a certain energy or that triggers something. Yeah, so, um, you can also look here, yeah. <laughs> what's next? Um, yeah, during this condition design period, there were, well, I call it condition design period, never mind, during those years, what was happening, the open web, that was super fascinating to us. The fact that you can collaborate with people all over physical distances, like no matter where you are on the planet. And the other thing is that you can just, uh, collaborate or play with the crowd like people because you distribute something over the web and loads of people would join in. So these two um, phenomena, they were really exciting for the things we wanted to do when we wanted to make these playgrounds or environments for people. So um, I show you now one work that is called do not touch.org and it's a crowdsourced music video that we made uh, in 2013, and it is very dated. Um, 
right now when you look at it, but uh, it was a work that was quite, um, it went all over the world. It was back then really something new kind of as well. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we had this idea when you visit a website, it feels kind of lonely and <laughs> and so why not uh, make something where you see others as well simultaneously. So we made this tiny little website experiment where you we, we recorded a mouse pointer and uh, then we superimposed your mouse pointer, your movement over the previous one. So basically you would see all the previous mouse pointers of people that have been on the website. And so we made this tiny little website experiment and it was so funny to see how people reacted to the ground beneath together. They decided apparently we want to stay in the white space. And uh, yeah, so we made, a, uh, we were asked to make a video clip for a band called Light Light. And um, so we made this website where we uh, thought, okay, we record the, as soon as you go to the website, do not touch.org, um, your mouse pointer gets recorded. And we also stated this. And it is also different back then. It was not so much the surveillance me mentality yet there, you know, now we know everything is always recorded when we're online. But uh, yeah, so we record the mouse pointer and we had a video playing beneath and we would just see what comes out. And I play you, for those that haven't seen it yet, uh, I play those.
not really a point, huh? <laughs> well, not well done. <laughs> yeah, so basically, um, as, as I told you, it was funny that we could see that the, the video also went over the world because of where people come from, they place their mouse. But uh, what was the most beautiful sensation, I mean, I must say that we also only showed the last 500 or something cursors because you cannot, I mean, there were millions of them now, otherwise it would be completely full. Um, but the, that you would, something would happen, that the sensation of being online together, you would really feel through this imagery. And also the fact, maybe you can even, even call it emergent behavior, that everybody together, they reacting upon each other again. And so you get these streams and the flow of the movement of all these cursors. So this is something we didn't really anticipate on or design in. Is it something that uh, happened? And we were like, oh, wow, that looks great. And uh, so this idea of the unexpected, that was also really the driving force, why we really like to play with the crowd and do stuff and see what do people do. So, uh, yeah, what uh, people did, they also, yeah, that's like tiny things. We figure, why are they always in the right up corner? Or like a lot of people did strange things. And that was, of course, to test the system, to figure, does it really work? Is it my cursor that I'm seeing here or my mouse pointer? Or, uh, yeah, I have to admit, we didn't really think the gender discussion wasn't that lively yet. Uh, people sitting on the oar, uh, of course. Uh, or, yeah, what uh, the smiley that got a nose, the crowd decided them. Okay, never mind. So, um, when we made this participatory works, you could say, yeah, we, um, it's not that we make participation, you think like you can do whatever, but we really carefully craft these environments, and it was not like all was fine. We really tried to be really precise and make things make people do things, so almost controlling them in a way. And this is also a very interesting um, moment uh, where we felt a lot of times, when do people hack the system? Or do they follow actually? How many limitations do we need to, get, to give them? Or how much freedom do we give to them for expression? And this uh, spot, this kind of a sweet spot, you could say, that we were also very interested in. And uh, yeah, when do they maybe break out? And there's an interesting, well, I think interesting work we made also a little bit later. And that is not online, that is offline. And um, uh, related also to this thought, which uh, is on a st in a in a physical um, on a concert hall on a stage, and uh, people become actors because we were invited by Montforta Zwischentöne, that is in Austria, a concert series for classical experimental music, and. Um, they asked us whether we could collaborate with a band and do a work which invites the participant, the audience to join in. And we thought, that's a really nice challenge. Let's uh, think about something. And so we came up with an idea uh, that I will show you. So uh, we have the people first sit on the uh, stage. I explain what would happen roughly. And um, where normally the chairs were, there was the playing field and there was a camera again mounted in the ceiling to record um, what was happening. And uh, uh, visitors, they became a hoodie, a colored hoodie, wa uh, yellow, red or blue, and also a headset according to the color they were having with instructions, with a soundtrack that would last um, half an hour. And after half an hour, they would be invited again to watch themselves back and then double speed. So the sort of instructions we gave them, it was not the idea to create shapes like, you know, Korean style, making really these beautiful forms, but it was that we gave them instructions how to behave 
uh, for each single person and no for per color but yeah you will understand when I explain further. Uh, so be, for example, yellow was told to follow blue, but tried to avoid red. And red was tried supposed to follow yellow, but avoid blue, and so forth. So this would lead into a chase. Or we told them to form a big group and bounce over the floor. But how do you act as a group when there is no leader, no director? No. <laughs> um, and yeah, so that was super, we were super curious what would happen. Or we tried a sorting algorithm um, that depending on the color of your neighbor, you had to change at the junctions, walk a different direction. This turned out into a complete model. Didn't work out, but something else happened and that doesn't really matter. So that was also interesting what people would come up with to do, how they would sort themselves. Or Depending on the color that was next to you, you had to run away and move over to the other side. And uh, so uh, we made this half an hour uh, piece by uh, thinking about it. If you look at it from the top, like a little model of society where uh, we came up with little chapters, how do groups organize themselves? They split up in smaller groups and smaller groups until you're an individual or daily routines. So it's pr quite abstract, but within these abstract things, we thought a lot of, about a lot of stories in order to come up with those instructions. And yeah, uh, for you to get an idea, I play a very brief uh, excerpt from the film. The film is like 11 minutes and uh, yeah, you'll see. Come on. Du bist gelb. Du kannst jetzt das Spielfeld betreten. This applause was edited in. Hmm? <laughs> they did applause at the very end, but not while performing, obviously. So, um, yeah, what was very interesting to us was the fact that we, uh, we didn't really know, do people join when we tell them what to do? And uh, it was a super nice see that everybody did it. Nobody said, no, I don't do it. Pregnant women, old people hard, that have difficulties to walk even. Um, and people really enjoyed very much being part of the group and just doing what you were told, not being maybe responsible for your own actions. 
because we learned from the web that people really look for the loopholes, really look for the escapes, really do other things than you were, they were told to do, was different here. And obviously, it has to do also with the fact, of course, that it is a physical uh, experience. And this is something also we are actually working on a work right now that is related, where we are busy with uh, trying to find out uh, how much do you follow a group and uh, and when is your border, where is your border, when do you say, okay, now I stop following the group, I do my own thing. It's now very abstract, it's about freedom and uh, yeah, it's an experience, interactive experience we are working on right now. Um, yeah, when talking, going back to 2017 about uh, the web again. So we were still very excited about what was going on, but we realized hey, the shifts, things are changing online. The open web was starting to get less open and big tech started to become more dominant, people going more to social networks and our work also became more critical. And we were contacted by Mozilla Foundation. And Mozilla, you know Mozilla maybe from Firefox. Mozilla Foundation is an organization that is super interesting and good. They, is an, they do advocacy work and uh, they fight for the open web, you could say. They are busy with web ethics and obviously as well AI, what's going on. And um, they ask us to make a campaign actually, um, yeah, to make a participatory campaign with them where people can join in and um, fight for the cause. And um, the topic that the campaign was about is net neutrality that I show you now. But we actually, we made a campaign tool. It was used also uh, twice also for the topic of um, copyright that was at stake. I'm not talking about that now online, uh, but um, the net neutrality campaign. And um, yeah, we our idea was uh, we had to think about the airborne leaflet propaganda that we know from history books, right? You drop a bomb with a huge amount of leaflets on the ground in to order to inform uh, the population. And so we thought, can't we drop digital leaflets on Google Earth? And yeah, uh, Google Earth didn't really work out, but uh, we built our own uh, map environment with map tiles. And uh, yeah, so we did this. Um, we made this pamphlet addressed to Chairman Pai, that was the commissioner of, of the, f the head of the federal communication commission um, and it was about that the net neutrality law uh, was abolished and that means net neutrality was that the hosting providers treat all data the same no matter whether you have an hairdresser website or a really big uh, website concerning the speed and um, unfortunately the campaign didn't help but it was a successful campaign in how people uh, spread it. That was really nice. So how it worked, when you enter the website, it was called Paperstorm, Paperstorm it, um, you would uh, fly directly towards um, Washington, where the federal communication is situated. But it's a map, right? You can move wherever you like. You can also drop leaflets at your hometown, zoom in, zoom out. Every leaflet has uh, is calculated that if it drops down, it has the size of an A4 sheet. And uh, yeah, it is the idea is that it's very seductive that you really try to click a lot of times and make lots of leaflets on the ground, cover the cover the ground and there was also a, a notification banner counting your um, drops and counting how other people, how many uh, leaflets were dropped, telling you to spread the message via Twitter or other social networks. 
But what we uh, incorporated in this campaign was that the leaflet wouldn't only drop down, tumble down where you were on the map, but it would tumble down exactly where you clicked. That means if you click a little bit next to it and a little bit next to it, it's actually a line. And if you can make a line, you can draw with it, right? This is something we didn't tell anyone to do, but this is what you can find out. And so it became kind of a drawing tool, very unhandy drawing tool, you could say. Um, and I'll show you what happened. No? Yeah, well, um, we recorded every location of every leaf where leaflet and when it was dropped, therefore we could make this animation afterwards. We could basically replay everything that was dropped and it, lots of leaflets were dropped thanks to Mozilla that were uh, promoting this obviously via their channels in a big way. So that really helps uh, very much when you make this uh, participatory works with a big, uh, with a crowd. But was also so interesting to see how much people engaged in it in order to make these drawings, although this was so unhandy. And maybe this was also the fun part, right? Because it was so difficult to draw with it that people took so much effort. It's really a challenging thing. And yeah, there were lots of beautiful drawings made, you've seen, but also... Um, yeah, lots of collective drawings that you would see. Somebody started something, somebody else continued uh, with it. Then there were uh, drawings that we couldn't figure out how people did it, like this perfect grid, because we designed or programmed it in such a way that it's really, you cannot hack it. Huh? But yeah, so somehow this happened. Or other really cute little things, like augmented the map into a shark. You know, the airplane becomes a shark. I think that's really very contemporary. Um, yeah, also lots of slogans and, and, and names, name tag, but also a lot of offensive things. As you've seen, lots of penises were drawn. Uh, or other really nasty, maybe even things, swastikas. So after a while, two days later, Mozilla approached us and said, hey, can't we, can't you? They were a bit nervous, although they're fighting for the open web. <laughs> yeah, I believe this is, this is great. This is like this full, like a toilet wall, you know, a wall for expression, whatever you do. This is how the world is, right? And uh, they wanted to have a moderation tool. I was like, what? We cannot moderate those little leaflets. So after negotiating with them a bit, um, we made for them a tool that they could drop 10 leaflets at a time. And so they had somebody <laughs> going over the world <laughs> and tried to camouflage the worst, <laughs> the worst bits. Oh, that was it's so funny. But also what you see that there was collective censoring, right? There was also other people that were making windows out of uh, swastikas, for example. Um, 
Yeah, so that was uh, censoring was a big thing. Or it was like kind of shocking. Okay, what's hap going on? And uh, this work leads also to uh, work that we did um, a little bit later, where we thought, <laughs> yeah, people love to draw penises, so <laughs> let's give them the opportunity. It's called. It's a website. It's called Do Not Draw a Penis. And this is a, a platform where you can doodle. And the situation was like that. Maybe you've seen it. There was Quick Draw introduced by Google, where you can doodle. And uh, Google was collecting lots of doodle drawings and make an incredible big data set, basically the standard data set of uh, 50 millions of doodles that became the standard data set for training neural networks. And, but of course, nothing offensive is in this uh, data set. So we made this doodling platform and we trained an AI using the data set of Google, but also trained it with penis drawings that we collected. <laughs> and so the, uh, our AI would also detect penises. Um, if you draw one, you get a warning. And after a couple of drawings, uh, slowly the voice, the narrative becomes more furious and start to shout at you. And so we're doing a big good job in education, right? Now, the, um, yeah, at the very end, I don't remember exactly what happened. He gets wild. She, actually, it's my voice. Um, <laughs> He, me. <laughs> okay, I show you. Is this a realistic representation of a tree? Imagine what you can draw if you could draw whatever you like. This is a funny aircraft career, we are learning from every airplane you draw. We assume this was a mistake. <laughs> Not everyone will agree on this being a arm yeah, we also try to avoid uh, the word. Um, after um, this was online for a while, we uh, collected, we have like half a million at least penis drawings. Um, we used the first 15,000 and added them as an appendix uh, to the Google data set uh, on our GitHub account. So, um, for it to be more complete. And then, of course, we cannot help it because it looks so cute, all those little doodles together, that uh, we made a kitchen towel. <laughs> yeah, so that uh, is uh, uh, woven in the textile museum in Tilburg. It's really beautiful quality and really nicely woven and in red and in uh, black yeah and uh, unfortunately we sold we sold it via our shop the studio moniker dot shop well well anyway but um yeah it sold out but if there is anybody that wants a big edition we can re-edition it maybe it's time to make a nike sneaker we think with a penis prints Yeah, so 2022, yeah, you could say the open web is dead. Big tech has captured the space and um, it has become an infrastructure for big capital. People are on social media mainly. This is where they define their identity as well. 
So, but in, uh, we have to go back very briefly because in 2018, we were still contacted by, contacted by um, M Plus, a museum in Hong Kong. And um, so we did another particip big participatory web work and um, I tell you, M Plus is a museum, a new museum for contemporary culture in Hong Kong. They compa compare themselves a bit to MoMA. They have a really rich, big collection. And in uh, the past 15 years or so, it was constructed by the Swiss architect Herzog and de Moron. It's a very beautiful modernist building with a huge, uh, actually the building itself is one huge LED facade. And they want to uh, show their, their collection, but also have commissioned work there. And they asked us to make a work for the opening of the museum. And it was of course a super nice uh, commission. And we were really proud to come up with something uh, and they wanted to have a participatory work where it's actually a really nice thought where uh, the Hong Kong public will become part of the creation, what is visible on the screen and, and also, also to embrace this new museum that it becomes a bit more of their thing. But as you know, we have so much experience with these web projects and what people do if they express themselves it's quite difficult in Hong Kong, especially in 2018, the changing political climate where you had started, the protests started, where China um, wanted to have more power over Hong Kong. So uh, this whole idea of freedom of speech was under pressure. And um, so it was quite a big challenge. Here you see uh, when uh, the, the building, it's 13 floors high and um, the facade is 7,000 uh, square meters big. You can see it over kilometers of distance. That's uh, Thomas, our creative developer at the studio, and me, we went to visit Hong Kong. We talked to a lot of directors and a lot of other <laughs> super nice people from the museum and get really involved and understand the culture there as well. Um, and then we came up with ideas. So we proposed at the beginning three ideas that didn't make it but I would like to show you this one that also didn't make it because I still love it really very much. And maybe you've heard of the place from uh, Reddit where people just could color a pixel and every five minutes or so, and then everybody together, the community would create this amazing um, yeah, collaborative pixel artworks that constantly change. And we thought it would be wonderful if we just have people uh, could uh, switch on a lamp on the facade, an LED lamp, or even determine the color. And as we know, moderation is an issue. We would have a cleaner that as soon as there were too many lamps on, he would switch them off again. So we would think, hey, this is a very funny idea to incorporate uh, the censorship is itself already in the idea. But it was too problematic, they were too afraid, and as well it was also touching another difficult topic in Hong Kong, which is, that's why also we came up with the cleaner, this big um, social inequalities, this whole household cleaning service personal from the Philippines and the uh, rather rich Hong Kong people. Yeah, so did didn't go through. But only in presentations, this is actually the first time that I presented. <laughs> you won't see it on our website. Um, so we went back to the drawing table and we came up with another topic that we felt was also very relevant to make a work about. And this is more global, the case, which is our addiction to our screens, the addiction to our phones. And um, yeah, especially in the pandemic, but even now after the pandemic, we're just living on the screen most of the time. And um, so, and we have a very, we're very 
we're critical about it, very disturbed about it, and we don't think this is the right direction to go. And we uh, made this work, which is called Touch for Luck. And here, the premise is, the longer you touch your phone, the luckier you get. So how it works is that uh, we use the phone as a, uh, so there's this website, Touch for Luck, and as soon as you touch with your finger the telephone, you turn into a little green fish. And uh, you can s move and swim around. So basically the facade turned into a pool, into a pond. And um, the other fish that you would see are the other players that are also live touching their phone. So we thought that is amazing also, and it's fact that it's possible to do, that you touch your phone and you see yourself directly huge on the facade. Doesn't really matter whether you're in Hong Kong or whether you're in Barcelona or whether you're in the Netherlands, you can control the facade from your phone. And um, yeah, so you are not allowed to lift your finger. And as long as you touch your phone, your fish kind of grows. It becomes a certain, uh, we call it lucky charm. So it gets more and more decorated and uh, it becomes more and more skills. So um, the um, total amount of touch time that you should reach, it's, you must see it a little bit as an art game. So you should touch it uh, until three hours and then after three hours you get into a certain elite group and after that uh, you can reincarnate and you uh, can get a new life cycle and but we know people not only touching the phone so what we introduce is the untouch time so the moment you lift your finger at the beginning you get very little untouch time and if your untouched time is over, you lose everything you have, right? All the gained charms. So at the beginning, you have five seconds of untouched time. And after a while, it gets longer and longer, uh, up to two days. But then you have to really touch for a long time. And there is a narrative going on. So that is referring to all these mechanisms that uh, social media are incorporating uh, in order to make us addicted to our screen. Um, but this is also a work that is a little bit in between. On one hand, it is very... We try to make it as seductive as possible, but on the other hand, it also hurts. It's sort of almost boring or it's really disturbing at least to keep on touching your phone. And um, yeah, this is also this yeah, friction that we were looking for. Uh, just to explain you a little bit about the narrative. So for example, after a while, you get a friend counter to your fish. So uh, as soon as you swim over another fish, you get another friend. And after a while, your friends you get a friend burst, friendship burst, so your friendships get doubled. And after a little while, uh, with every new friend, you get 10 more friends. So we make this whole friend collection more uh, hollow, you could say. Or if you swim over another fish, after a while you get the skill that you can generate little hearts, love hearts. So we refer to these online dating mechanisms. Or you get at one point a little camera a selfie camera that always swims next to your fish. So anytime you can tap your camera and take a selfie and show what you have gained. And then you get teleported into a, a different world that we also really like to make these little pixel designs. Yeah, we make these all different uh, worlds uh, that you get teleported in. And yeah, so basically there was very little expressions. You see, this doesn't need, need to be moderated. Um, you can do little dances. This is basically the most you can do. Uh, you can maybe invite others to swim with you and play this way uh, with, um, uh, yeah, with the fellow players. Oh, that's a bit loud. 
Uh, I just got uh, to tell you this is right now uh, live. Oh, no, this image not, but this work is um, again commissioned for six weeks to be on the screen right now from like last week for the next coming six weeks. So if you play, you will be visible in Hong Kong on the facade. Yeah, so um, now. <laughs> I must say we are a little bit fed up with the digital space and how it's developing. On one hand, because this experimental open web works, they don't work anymore. People don't go just to these URLs. Um, people are on the apps, on social networks. So the way we were working, that doesn't really work anymore. And also we're a little bit fed up with criticizing everything all the time, what is going on. So why not looking into new directions and domains that we think this is interesting and this is what we think is uh, uh, what we should um, yeah, play with. And there is obviously very interesting developments right now in the digital space, such as GPT-3. We've also lately made a work about that and the fact that, uh, you know, what does it mean if authorship becomes obsolete? What is the difference between the human and the machine? Can you still say what is the difference? And, but in general, we think that this whole premise of living in this frictionless world, or there is a, at all a frictionless world, this doesn't hold up. And digital technology always sells us this thought. All the apps that are developed always try to optimize something to make it even more smooth or quicker or more comfortable. You can pack so many meetings into the same time because you're behind your screen on Zoom or whatever uh, environment. And we believe this is not, this doesn't work. We need friction. We need Friction is very valuable. We don't want digital technology to create a frictionless world. So um, this friction, you could say, is everything we have in order not to glide off of, of your surrounding. And uh, as you can tell, we are very opinionated and uh, with our ideas and say these things as well. And this leads me to an experiment I would like to show you. It's the last uh, one. That is, uh, yeah, we call it sometimes the Office of Screenless Technology. And in fact, what it is, these are uh, performance, performative, or well, conversations that my business partner, Ruhl Wouters, and me have. And then we, um, yeah, we both, you don't see us both now, but uh, together, we really like to discuss and we'd like to reflect upon what's happening and how should we continue with our studio? Do we need to change? Uh, how do we want to develop? Uh, when we were back, uh, back in the years teaching at the Art Academy in Amsterdam, we sometimes were the two of us in front of the class. And it was kind of funny because then we would have arguments in front of the t uh, students and they loved it because then you could see uh, first of all, this friction, there was really engagement and really like uh, substance to, to discuss and also to see, hey, there are so many different views on something. So um, we, at one point, that was in 2020, uh, we rented out an, a separate space in the building where we have our studio and on for half a day of the week only. And we would sit there and we would f uh, lead discussions that between the two of us. And um, we recorded those because we felt when we record those discussions, we are nicer to each other. We let the other finish the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> we don't jump into something. I know what you're going to say. And we are... Um, we have this imaginary audience. We try to frame maybe our thoughts a bit more precisely. So basically this uh, filming, that was quite helpful, almost like a psychologist sitting next to us. And um, yeah, so I just play you one tiny fragment out of one situation. Uh, I don't know 
there's so many it's a vehicle like a political mm -hmm. message it's also some, somehow you have this this political thing and you know that that somehow it's an accepted discourse and people because that people all everybody wants to be engaged you know and if mm -hmm. they then engage in our project you know they, they feel good about it you know and that is then a sort of a safe place to make something but the joy of the make is not really in sort of as, now it, what, one part of it is of course in defining that precise discourse like what do we want to say and what not but the most joy is more in the fact that are we able to to make, make it successful some, to make it where yeah make work. it work mm -hmm. yeah anyway it felt uh, you know like many many discussions we had we all filmed those and we thought like hey this is kind of interesting uh, maybe we could make a podcast out of it <laughs> and oh yeah and we didn't not only um um we have these conversations also there were times that we did a lot of little experiments there was one occasion that i had I, I painted rule yellow in the face and i would let him mimic the emojis <laughs> i gave him a little uh, image to have a look how it looks and then i just play you a little fragment we made a film out of it rolling on the floor laughing Face with tears of joy. Slightly smiling face. Winking face. Smiling face with smiley eyes. Face with a blowing kiss. Okay, yeah, well, it is, it, uh, I don't let it run. There are many, many makes. And then there was uh, an invitation from an artist, um, Kurdin. He has this um, arts residency in the Swiss mountains in Engadin. And he invited us to make a work for the facade. He has uh, these um, QR codes engraved in the facade. And he asked artists to make a work, uh, AR work. So basically, if you scan with your phone the QR code, you would have an overlay over the house, over the facade with your work. And we thought maybe this is a good occasion for us to make this podcast series. So super enthusiastic, having a plan. We went to Switzerland into the mountains. Mm. Okay, welcome to this new episode of two emoji in a car getting coffee. Yeah, so we thought let's not have the podcast, the, the, the um, conversation between Rule and Luna, but let's have the conversation between two emojis, right? Talking about technology and the developments of technology. We thought that's quite cool. We actually, Thomas from our studio, he um, built this headset. Uh, where we could insert our mobile phone in the front and uh, when we would wear this headset you uh, we had our faces filmed directly and uh, so we were sitting in the Swiss Alps <laughs> with this headset on filming ourselves and a third camera to film the whole setting and it all didn't go that well <laughs> to say it mildly so first of all, we had to get up really early in the morning at five o'clock or well, for us it was early and sit there at six o'clock before the sun comes up because the sun would otherwise interfere because we're very concerned, of course, having a beautiful video footage. So we were there. it was really cold and we're sitting there in the blouse, freezing. We were unprepared because we thought, let's have a very natural conversation without knowing beforehand what we would talk about and ask each other. Um, it turned out that the first day we were talking about uh, identity and about uh, the ego and the self. Um, the second day we, uh, we always used a different location. We would sit in front of the mountains we really thought this is a beautiful image of having this age-old, beautiful, static mountains talking about the fast-changing digital 
world. And actually, it was about uh, the second day we said, hey, we have to beforehand discuss what the topic is. So we decided it would be about tech optimism. And Ruhl asked me whether I'm a tech optimist or not. And I got really uh, into uh, on slippery ice. I don't tell you what the answer was. <laughs> and the third day, we thought, OK, let's talk about Web3. Because that was also, a, it's a really important topic. We were also busy with it. We thought also at one point, yeah, let's uh, make NFTs. And um, blockchain is obviously very interested in also uh, cryptocurrencies. But what happened is that somehow during the conversation, we, at least I felt, hey, I know far too little. Actually, this world is so complex. It's so... We, I cannot really comfortably talk. So he pokes me all the time and I'm like, ah, I feel more and more uncomfortable. Basically, we get into a fight. And what is even more uh, uh, funny is that it, a thunderstorm came up. It started to rain, the light, it got super dark and it was very dramatic and absolutely not our podcast series as we had it in mind at the beginning. And this is also what, uh, <laughs> yeah. what we realized that this work is not really about the ideas that we exchange to each other. This is rather about our relationship, maybe more, about how smart we want to sound or yeah, about our ego yeah, and all those emotions. And also very much about aging. I mean, it's also really funny, these very old phases of ours <laughs> to <laughs> have them in this uh, makeup style. It's very confronting. I really like it. <laughs> but actually, these emotions is obviously that what makes the difference to machines and what makes us human. And um, maybe also what makes it worthwhile listening to these conversations. So we think this is also the friction that we really like. So this is the, you could see this also almost as a manifest for friction. I play you a very short fragment from the first day so you get a little bit of an idea. This is in a studio a test. Yeah. Do you have another? Uh, of course, it's a representation of the emoji. And the, and, but um, yeah, that's a, that's sort of obvious, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, so all our emojis so are like superficial. We can, uh, we can make lots of faces without looking ridiculous, right? You know what I was thinking? That because I have the sound a bit up. Yeah. Uh, it's much easier to have a conversation or to say things uh, even though they are really stupid or maybe not so interesting because... This makes up. Maybe you can make the sound a bit harder. Substance. Yeah, <laughs> it makes up for the it's, 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 it's anyway an, 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 an sort of an observation on what kind of levels are things happening here, right? Yeah. Um, on one hand, you could say... Um, and we are very much busy with expressing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we're forced to express ourselves, and we're maybe stressed about how do we appear. Uh, so we're on a peak of, uh, you know, it's all about your personal expression. Um, maybe online, also about especially. Mm -hmm. Maybe also in generally about yourself. Yeah, 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 exactly. The You Museum, you know, we have in Amsterdam a You Museum. So it's yeah. like all about you and selfie and stuff. Um, on the other hand, you could say, we are <laughs> on the peak of an identity crisis because um, we all use the same tools. You know, we are sort of uh, following the master, we're following the big tech, the, for us the tools. You know, we're like a big herd of sheep, um, you know, running behind the same thing. Yeah, so that reminds me of this, this essay, right? Yeah, the, the sound is not so good, doesn't matter. Um, yeah, you can tell probably how uncomfortable we were. Um, <laughs> the fourth day, we thought, okay, this is not going to work, we do something else. What we did then was like 
we were trying to talk about the emotions we had uh, and reenact those. Uh, never mind. Um, we felt a little bit like being back at art school. And um, because we had no idea what would come out then in the end. And this is also maybe something which is nice to encourage people here to just make things that you've interested it in, but you don't really know what it will become. Yeah, so uh, right now we are also um, thinking about there's a uh, producer and also a film director that really loves the material that uh, she has seen and uh, we are basically probably making a film with the material. Yeah. So I... Um, is a little bit more concluding thoughts. Um, when stating at the beginning and up from time to time through the lecture designing friction, I would like you also to invite uh, thinking about what could that mean exactly? We know that uh, digital technology is not going to disappear. So then the question is, could we not, and we know that a f we don't want digital technology to be used for this frictionless experience, can't we use digital technology in order to design friction? So for example, um, think about social network that is not based on like-minded people that you're all the same in the same bubble, but that you have a social network that um, tries to connect people or where you can encounter people that are completely different or the opposite ideas in such a way that you listen to each other. Or like a map system where you, that at one point switches off or tells you, hey, ask somebody on the street or walk with somebody on the street or ask your friends and discuss the best route. Like come up with other ideas technology can help us with in order to have rather those frictionful experiences. Because this is, in the end, what we believe in, that we only believe that uh, f experiences full of friction or with friction, or maybe call it disruption, or maybe a certain extent poetry, will lead to a more meaningful and a deeper um, relationship with our surrounding, and in the end also uh, with ourselves. That is the <laughs> Yeah, uh, please. Hmm? Is this the sound is off? But yeah, uh, oh no, it's not off. I'm very happy to uh, talk with people. <laughs> if there's any uh, anybody want to ask something or uh, uh, yeah. You don't have to be afraid, as you've seen in the film. Hello. Um, here. Uh, first of all, thank you for the amazing talk. Um, I find all the works very inspiring. Um, during our own research for our final project, we are, um, one of our friends actually mentioned your work, uh, Moniker's work, and we found that um, um, conditional design and participatory design is very might be very helpful for us. So I was thinking if you um, could share a bit about how you, um, about the creative process you guys go through, how you come up with ideas and solutions and so on. Mm. How we come up with ideas. I can tell you it's very easy. <laughs> no, okay. I mean, if you think now about participatory works, mm -hmm. I mean, we have made so many works in this realm where we really thought about all different kinds of inputs, like using your camera input. So basically we, we also think about techniques. What didn't we do yet? What drawing or photographing certain things? Um, actually, right now we are also busy with a film, we call it a multiplayer film, where you also become film directors. 
but um, there's not such an easy way. But for us, it was not so difficult because we have already this kind of framework in which we like to work. So, yeah. And then obviously it's also experience that you know uh, how much freedom and how many limitations do I need to uh, design or provide mm -hmm. that, um, for example, testing it on a small scale is quite important also, you know, before you make it big. And then the other thing is, I mean, a lot of people like, yeah, participation is great and uh, online, but uh, first of all, you need to have an audience. How do you distribute it? How do people know about it? And that is also most of the time not really thought through at the beginning. I mean, if you have a really big followers on the line, then it's maybe less of a problem. But that is uh, maybe it's also better if you're really interested in this terrain to think more specifically about the precise location where you want to place this work, you know, that you think really about the context and how does the people there, how you can use them. Is that a little bit uh, helpful? Thank you. Um, I was thinking as as there are the room is full of young designers and and people still at the university. What would be your recommendation or advice for them? When getting out, as you has become, you you have become a, a successful designer, and, and have been able to build some of these artworks because the audience you have worked around, right? How young designers uh, can build these audiences? I can build what? Uh, the audience. The, the audience. Of, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. First of all, I think the best advice is um, to follow your heart. <laughs> and not follow the client. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, at least, I mean, of course it is the, um, the context in which we were operating, we were able to operate and I'm sure it's very different now when we were starting. I mean, now we have a sort of known in a certain um, world and therefore people come to us, but of course at the beginning you don't have that. And we back then, we had funding from the government or from uh, like funds funds for starting designers that helped to pay the bills basically. And uh, we didn't need to uh, take jobs that we wouldn't like to do. And also I think when people think, oh yeah, I have to do this for the client, I never felt and, and therefore I cannot do my own thing. And I never really felt this split because I always did my own thing for the client, if that makes sense. So always try to stay within what you're interested in and try to merge it, combine it with that, what maybe the, the a client would like to. Because without any client, yeah, that's obviously not what we want. I mean, it's nice to do self-initiated work, but not only or I mean it's also nice if people come to you and want something from you so yeah there you were asking this yeah so that would be my advice do try to um, follow your own ideas what you think is relevant right now for this world in which you want to uh, what voice you want to have develop a voice that's basically it also, if there is someone from the City Hall of Barcelona, you can start <laughs> a public funds for designers. <laughs> um, I don't necessarily have a question, but more so a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it was very refreshing to see your work and how it wasn't focused on a result or an expectation, but more so on a process of mere curiosity mm -hmm. and like a social experiment mm -hmm. and seeing where it goes with no specific expectation. And for me, that's the, like the strongest points I get out of this lecture, I think. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love it that you see this. Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. Being curious, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a yellow, a blue, a black. <laughs> um, so you were talking about uh, designing friction right yeah. here. 
And I would like to know if you had to work or try to work with not like-minded people and, and like projects, and if it was fruitful or the experience wasn't so good mm -hmm. as the people you mm -hmm. used to work to. No, no, I don't like, you mean like uh, collaborators that I would work on to create the work or yes, you mean yes, clients? exactly. No, no, yeah. uh, collaborators. Um, no, I never, no, because I, um, I mean, my business partner, Hul Wouters, and also I didn't really uh, ex say that explicitly, but at, we started Monica in 2011 with the three of us, also with Jonathan Pucky. He left Monica uh, five years later. And we have so much creative and so three big heads, basically, that that was bas almost enough. So I didn't really collaborate with other people uh, on projects. But of course, we have like really nice uh, colleagues, you know, like creative developers. They also think with us or interns or designer or so. But there we don't. That always went really, uh, I mean, hey, okay, what I'm saying, no, lots of fights, obviously, but not like you don't think this is an interesting thinker that you want to join in. So basically having uh, different opinions, but you meet each other and the thing gets better like this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, continuing the, the idea of the, the um, friction design. Um, going back to your Tuesdays in your kitchen and uh, discussing with your partner and, uh, and Jonathan, I was actually wondering, uh, because later your works actually reinforced the concept of designing friction, but how did you actually come up with this concept? Like I was, I was wondering how, because you and your partner, I mean, it sounds like you're kind of like intellectual soulmates <laughs> and I think it's really amazing when you like I don't know meet people that you're like kindred spirits intellectually mm -hmm. and um, you have really fruitful uh, conversations and concepts and ideas and I was wondering how was that talk that dynamic back mm -hmm. then yeah well it took uh, three quarters of a year to write this <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we were studying a lot of also history, like flux, uh, fluxes movements. And I mean, there is this idea of not designing uh, static things, but this idea of uh, designing environments. It's not completely new or something, but we just felt that at that time it made most sense for that what we were interested in, right? As I tried to explain, we... we Usually, when you do the design education, you come more from designing shapes or forms, maybe even also concepts. But we were really like trying to come up with ideas that how can we describe something which is constantly changing and evolving. And so this is yeah, I, so long time ago. I don't really know how it came up it's with discussions from week to week. And we're really also writing and rewriting every sentence. And then no, it has to be different. And um, yeah. Um, but yeah, it reflects also pretty much also the time back then. Eh? So it was in the air, as I said, also generative design was coming up. The fact that you program designer, eh? that you write code in order to gener generate shapes. And uh, yeah, but we always felt, I, I hope this is still visible, for us this, tech, this computational part is very important, but then again also this human aspect and how they come together. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I was specifically interested in the combination of friction and paradigm shift, and I guess kind of how do you design a paradigm shift? I mean, I think we usually look at these shifts as almost happening organically, but I think there are ways that designers can kind of influence them. And then specifically looking at these friction points, for example, the friction that you have with your partner seems mm -hmm. to be at the right balance of like, 
you know, you're a bit uncomfortable, but you're able to produce something out of it. How do you design friction and then keep in mind that if it gets out of balance, mm -hmm. you know, you could be dealing with very scary consequences that are not necessarily productive, especially in a digital space. As you mentioned, it's very hard to moderate. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, it's a very good question. I didn't really think so much yet about that, but I'm planning to write a manifesto for designing friction. So wait another year. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah because... Um, you're right, it's the question of a balance, yeah? It is, and I stated here rather bluntly, rather bold, um, to make things more clear, because in general, um, apps are created always for this efficiency data collection for making mo things more comfortable. And I think in general, we need to, this paradigm shift, I, I really see it very broad about our life that we shouldn't think always the easiest, the smooth way is the right way. So this is what I want to emphasize with it. But you're right, of course, yeah, there are of course certain extremes what you think this is shouldn't be the goal, and that's also the problem. You know, with everything we develop with technology, a new prep, it solves one problem, and the other problem, it it creates other problems. So, I think this idea of problem solving is also something we have to rethink. And yeah, I cannot be more precise right now, but uh, yeah, maybe later, because it's true. There's different. It's very bold very different sorts of friction and very, it's more the, the mind that I want to emphasize. Yeah. Hello, here in the back. Yeah. First of all, I would like to thank you for the talk. I think it's really nice to see you like, after seeing your work for several years, <laughs> to see you here in Barcelona. So I would like to thank you also to Elisaba or everyone that did this, ha like make this happen because I think it's great to have you here. In Barcelona. Um, so my question, uh, after having like a long checklist or wish list, because you've inspired organizations, companies, we've seen it through your work, like designers like us, um, what is like what is a desire or like a wish that you have for yourself in the future as a personal designer, creator, and one uh, like dream that has the studio also, Monica? You think that there's a difference between my and the studio? I yeah. don't know. <laughs> well, you know, uh, there is also this conflict that we're constantly discussing. What are we, you know, are we now media artists or are we a design studio? How we should call ourselves? Are we an interaction studio or, yeah, filmmakers? You know, it is always this label, other people want you, I mean, if you make a website and you have to call yourself something, I mean, everybody you probably knows this problem, we have it still, we cannot decide. And so Rul and me all the time have these discussions. Yeah, because if we make, to be really honest, uh, if we make more um, digital works, they pay better because people pay rather more for something programmed than for a, let's say, a performance in a theater. It's, di it's different money most of the time as well. And uh, I cannot tell you, so um, personally, ideally there is, so there has been a thought, but we're not gonna do this, that we would like do what we like, our projects, and, and there is a studio aside that does this kind of interesting work that profits from our name, and we can step a little bit away from it. But I think that's an illusion, one, and second, it's not really what I want. Um, and uh, personally, as I mentioned also in the talk there, I'm very interested in also stepping a little bit away from the digital space and creating experiences or interactive experience right now also for uh, younger people uh, about um, the idea of freedom and I really like to also dive into these concepts that we have in our society and try to make them experience with people in a physical space. So this is a little bit a direction that I like to go to. 
Yeah. Hi. Uh, first of all, I share the feeling of gratitude for being here, and that Gaston just said, so thank you. <laughs> and going a bit back, I understand that it's not really your plan from what you said to continue in the digital space, but going back to those participatory uh, work, more specifically the ones with where the user should do like small actions and form things very guided in a group, like do not touch and mm -hmm. such. I really love that kind of work, um, but this, this thought came to my mind. If I was doing it, I would probably end up being paranoid about this feeling of sometimes maybe not being sure that if I'm offering like a meaningful experience to those users or if I'm kind of weaponizing like their participation for my own work. Mm -hmm. Have you ever confronted that kind of maybe paranoia? Maybe that wasn't really ever the aim of giving like an experience. I don't know. Can you tell me something about that? Yeah, well, uh, sure. We thought about that a lot, but we never felt one paranoia and second we don't force people really right they can decide for themselves so if you really see also some works are more successful than others and then they are for some reason we think hey this is fantastic people would love play with this but actually they are not you know so you c it's really hard to detect it really depends also in the time you know in the years and um a little bit people also are saturated uh now, this is not a new idea at all. It's used a lot for commercial uh, um, purposes, incorporate, you know, like incorporating your followers to do stuff. And um, I don't uh, care so much if people want to join in because we give them a good time as well. <laughs> so they're free to not do it, you know, and actually the fun thing is that a lot of times they're also looking for hacks. There are lots of examples that I didn't show now where people really, it's really nice to see to make something that we didn't ask them to, but it's also possible if you think three times around. Uh, yeah. And it's also, I must m maybe also um, uh, say that we are also still busy with digital projects. There's uh, also, as I said, with GPT-3, we have also one really nice uh, participatory plan that's lying right now at Google Arts and Culture. That's an organization they ask us sometimes to come up with ideas. All yeah. right, thank you. Hi, here. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the talk. It was really, really inspiring. And I personally got very inspired by um, how it seems that you've always dedicated like active time to just thinking and reflecting and discussing. Like you were explaining us from the beginning with your Tuesday evening meetings in your kitchen mm -hmm. to more recently with your partner, like reserving mm -hmm. half a day in the week to just discuss. Mm -hmm. And to me, it feels really like dreamy to do these discussions without like an expectation just for mere curiosity. But at the end, I feel like there there was an outcome. Like at the end, of the first experiments, there w you published the book, and now mm -hmm. these discussions develop into a podcast. Mm -hmm. And so, I was thinking if um, the discussion with like a, out, without expectation and just because of curiosity, if you actually feel kind of pressure in some way that there should be an outcome of this time or how you deal with it? Yeah. No, uh, no, actually not. But um, no, I don't feel pressured of an outcome at all, actually. But uh, because we didn't really intend to do anything with these discussions, it was really more important for us to develop further. So in that sense, it's an outcome. Yeah, because uh, obviously it is something that happens in your brain. And I also would like to mention, if you're interested in creating this something, experimentation moments, it is not easy to do that because there's always no time to do it. You are so disciplined and really do it, shift appointments, don't do this or that, really save the time. It's really uh, not as easy as it might seem. So we really also, and I'm also German, uh, that helps maybe <laughs> very disciplined doing this every week. At, yeah, because if you start to do it once not, then maybe to do it again, but then the next time maybe again not. And then it's also, um, 
it stops. Yeah, so it, and we did, by the way, many more workshops, sometimes Thursdays in a studio, and we had once made a website, but it's offline with super nice experiments. Um, yeah, just, just for fun, everybody had to come up with an experiment, whatever it is. And I was teaching, actually, at the Rietveld back in the days, uh, I started the class always with fascination presentations. They had to give a, a presentation about what they're fascinated by, with, uh, without, uh, that it has nothing to do with graphic design or whatever the subject really, but just anything they're, they're fascinated with. So I also try to stimulate that to think, to, to formulate what you think about the world or whatever detail it is, how milk connects with another substance. Yeah, really cool, thank you. Super nice, so many questions. <laughs> so I had a, firstly, thank you for your talk, which was super interesting. I had a question about technology, which has already been answered. So I'm going to ask you something else, because I've been for many years kind of observing what's happening in the Riedfeld Academy, which is oh, obviously yeah. a really interesting. And I previously also had a, had a teacher who was there. Mm -hmm. And it's a very unique kind of art school. And I wondered... To what an extent did the inf education that you have there influence where you are now? In a sense that, had you come from a kind of really traditional, I don't know, sort of typical academy, would you be there now where you are, or would you say that this kind of interdisciplinary education, where you're also maybe questioning the boundaries of subjects, where you are also maybe experimenting with other materials, other things, mm -hmm. or even forced to do so, um, if that kind of helps you or helped you to where you are now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I was studying before I studied at the Rietfeld two years in uh, Germany, Pforzheim, it's the city called. And then I did at first an internship in Amsterdam. And then only I got to know uh, the Rietfeld via uh, friends. And then I started there. And I was not satisfied where I studied before in Germany because I didn't know better. I was doing really beautiful things. And then I came at the Rietfeld. But I was at the side also interested bit in philosophy and, you know, a bit how, how things work. And when I came to the Rietfeld, I figured out that I could combine my interest about the world with my practice. So these are not two separate things. And that had a big influence, this recognition. Uh, that was a big uh, Eureka effect that I had. And... Um, yeah, so I showed you my final exam work. Yeah, that is uh, obviously maybe a sign because I was interested in uh, technology. So that that was definitely stimulated as a conceptual design uh, education. So I was really uh, glad about that. And I for sure wouldn't be here now if I wasn't, wouldn't be, I don't know what would happen. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was super nice there. But now I think it's also different eh? because uh, with the web, Everybody knows a little bit what's going on everywhere. You could really just check online or talk to people. I mean, when I studied back then, there was no internet yet. Um, yeah, so things were much more different and separate also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Super. Well, talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs>